Good morning, everyone, and a special good morning to all of you at the Israel and Prophecy meetings who would normally, in normal conditions, meet at the All Souls Clubhouse there in London. And a special thank you to Sally Richardson for arranging um, these messages by MP3. My name is Reverend John Jones and uh, it's a pleasure again to be speaking to you all and this morning I'm going to be bringing two messages, the first one of which I've called Love Not the World and is taken from 1 John chapter 2. But before we begin, let's bow our heads and commit the time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your precious word. I thank you for the saints. I thank you for my brothers and sisters hearing this message. I pray that you grant wisdom and discernment to your servant this day to bring clarity to this word that you have given in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everyone. As I said previously, this message, this first message, is called Love Not the World. And I believe it's appropriate at this time, in this age. Let's begin by reading our text today, and that is from 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse two, uh, verse 12 sorry, to verse 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 17. Let's begin at verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Praise God for his word. Now the Apostle John is believed to have written this epistle in about 90 AD. 90 AD. This will be a few years prior to his writing of the book of Revelation, which most scholars believe was written in about 96 AD and his death occurred shortly after this. This epistle is not attested to any particular church so it's therefore deemed to be a general letter to be circulated and read in and amongst many churches. Now in one of my recent messages I taught about what the narrow way actually means. In this message we're going to look at the way the Apostle John taught the followers of Christ to make him, that's Jesus Christ, our sole advocate, an advocate, antidote for sin, while we walk this straight and narrow way, which is fraught with all kinds of 
trials and temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil. So let's begin this study uh, and look at what this great apostle has to teach us today. First of all, I want to look at a particular point that John uses here, and that's the three different ranks, I've called it, three different kinds of ranks of maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle John, in his wisdom, understands, as should we, that not everyone in the church as a whole, or generally, or in each individual fellowship, are at the same level of understanding or maturity in Christ Jesus. This is something that as preachers and teachers, or even pastors, we can sometimes forget when we minister. It's something that we all need to remember as we seek to bring others with us along this straight and narrow way. John, however, does this in a very thoughtful and sensitive way in our text today. John uses three ranks or different types of uh, believer here. Number one, he he uses young children. Number two, young men. And thirdly and finally, fathers. He begins with this in verse 12, if we read again. 1 John 2 verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now John begins with little children. Now this, these two words are actually one Greek word, which is technion, technion. And it means an infant, that is figuratively darlings. Christian converts, little children. It's a diminutive of the word technon, not technion. It's a diminutive or root uh, from the root technon, which means a child as produced a son or a daughter. It's obvious that it's one who is a new convert. One who is a new convert, a new believer in Christ Jesus. To these new believers, John emphasises that they should continue to consider that their sins have been forgiven, blotted out completely, by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That they're now clean. And because they're now clean and holy in Christ, there is a need to remain clean by remaining in a close relationship with Christ. And that through prayer and reading of the word for Christ's namesake. Our next verse goes further, as we'll now see. Let's read together. Verse 13. 1 John 2, verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I'll stop there for a moment. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Now here we see the use of the word fathers, which is the Greek word, word pater, meaning father as a parent, or the originator and transmitter of anything. It can mean the authors of a family or society of persons, animated by the same spirit as himself. It can mean one who has infused his own spirit into others who actuates and governs their minds. Or it can mean one who stands in a father's place and looks after another in a paternal way. These are all descriptions from the Greek dictionary. This is actually a very complicated word, as it's also used for God our Father, and so on. 
However, in the context of our text, it should be taken to mean any of the definitions that I've set before you from the Greek dictionary. It's describing one who has greater understanding and maturity in the faith. It should normally mean an elder or a pastor, etc. A leader, although sadly this is not the case in many fellowships these days. There doesn't seem to be the maturity of understanding or the maturity of faith in many leaders in the church in general today. The fellowship being an exception to that rule. John states fathers because they have or should have known him that is from the beginning. This word known is the Greek word ginosko, which means the following. These again are from the Greek dictionary. Number one, to learn to know, to come to know, to get a knowledge of, perceive or to feel, to become known, to know, understand, have knowledge of. It's also a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, to become acquainted with, to know, intimately. As you'll no doubt say, this word describes more than a mere passing understanding. It describes a very intimate knowledge and understanding, as with that between a man and a wife. It describes both the intimate knowledge and understanding of the word, and also the God of that word. Such is the standing of one who ascribes to be a teacher, a leader in the body of Christ. Sadly again, this is not the case in many instances, but I'll say more on this later. Let's go on with this, the rest of this verse in uh, verse 13 in our text. I've already said, I write unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. So let's continue with the, the verse. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. The apostle then mentions young men. Now this phrase is actually the Greek word, one Greek word, naaniskos, naaniskos, which means a youth, usually under 40, which for you under 40 will be an encouragement, no doubt. Aniskos means a youth, usually under 40, a young man. Here it would seem that John is describing someone who is not a father in the faith, has learned and overcome in some facets of life, etc., but is not a leader in the body. It really speaks of what should be an average believer, if there is such a thing, an average believer. John then addresses the little children. I write unto you little children. Again, concluding our verse 13. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. He then addressed again, sorry, addresses the little children, second time. However, here he uses a different Greek word. The word used previously in verse 12, if you remember, was technion, which meant an infant, a little child. Here in verse 13, he rather uses the Greek word pahidion, Pahedion. This word means a childling of either sex, that is, properly an infant, or by extension, a half-grown boy or girl, an immature child, a young child, 
young boy or a damsel. And really it's speaking of an immature Christian. I think that you'll see here that there is a, a subtle yet marked difference in the description between the two words. The word technion, or little children, little sons, is an affectionate term that John uses referring to all to whom he writes, actually. You'll see this in the uh, scripture examples, or you would have done, that I had put on a transparency. But I'll give you the scripture references here, which are as the following. If you want to write them down, they are 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John 2, verse 28. 1 John chapter 3 verse 18 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 and 1 John chapter 5 verse 21 these are all occurrences where John used technion technion or little children or little sons as an affectionate term in his letter whereas the word pahedion, pahedion, or little children, infants, is used only in the following. Again, I would have had this on transparency if I'd have been there, but I'll give you the scripture verses, scripture references rather, for you to jot down yourselves. Pahedion is used in the following two scripture references that are, they are, 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, which we've just read in our text, and 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. This echoes in some way the use of these same words by Jesus himself in the following places. John, uh, sorry, Jesus himself used the word technion in the Gospel of John chapter 13 verse 33 and he also used pahedion in the Gospel of John chapter 21 verse 5. The usage of these words as he did in our text in, in a way mirrors the usage of Jesus in his instruction to Peter as follows. And we're going to read John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. John chapter 21, Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. I'll start from verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou more, me more than these? And he, that's Pete, uh, Peter, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Now these expressions of both the Apostle John and the Lord himself reveal the love, compassion and consideration that all those in positions of leadership should have and show towards the people under their care. They also show us, however, the responsibility that we all have from the newest believers amongst us 
to the most mature leaders in Christ, to both keep the faith and also to maintain the standards that God expects from all who would be followers or disciples of his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, brethren, we have the following verse, 1 John 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Again, John addresses the fathers, the most mature in the Lord, the leaders. It is a mistake to think that if we have been in the Lord for a considerable, considerable amount of time and we have achieved a position of leadership that we no longer need to be taught or to learn. It is a mistake. The Apostle's words should permanently echo in the ears of all, all in leadership. All, that is everyone, needs to come to God with the, sight, with the word and seek wisdom and discernment. All of us. John then again speaks to the young men. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. You know, it's often the way of young men to boast of their strength. It is therefore important for such in Christ to remember and acknowledge that their strength comes from the Lord. As Isaiah writes in chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30 and 31. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Brethren, it's a reminder to the young and confident in Christ that they are indeed strong and that they have overcome the wicked one, Satan. But they have done so in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit, not in their own strength. It's important then, before we go further, that we all remember the following. And I'd like us to read together 2 Corinthians. Verse, uh, chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Hallelujah. Why is this important to us? Why, you may ask, has the Apostle John taken so much pains to remind believers of all levels of the knowledge and understanding in Christ of just where their strength and resilience comes from. Well, brethren, put simply, it's because he knew exactly where the temptation to look elsewhere would come from. The temptation to look for help with uh, for help, for comfort, for strength, for direction and so on. He knew well 
the words of warning in the scripture as follows. Let's read the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Brethren, John knew well that the world was and is full of temptations of all kinds and that the God of this world, small g, the devil, Satan, is the master of knowing just which ones to use against every single one of us. Brothers and sisters, the devil has been at this a long time. and he has perfected his work. For even Jesus himself had to experience this temptation of the devil that he might overcome the enemy of God for us. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 says this, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That's Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. And again we have Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succour them that are tempted. John knew that we all, even those who have been saved a long time, are tempted at times to look to others or to elsewhere, to other things, for help when difficulties or hard times come upon us. We can sometimes tend to look to things or to people that we used to rely on, other than trusting in the Lord. After all, it is easier to trust in things that you can see and feel, isn't it, rather than a God whom you cannot. Isn't that true? And this, my brethren, is why the Apostle John has addressed every level of believer as he has about whom they have believed and to whom they belong. For now he has done so, he continues to the core of his message, to them and to us. So let's continue with our text. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through to 17. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 excuse me through to 17. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Now here I'd like to first point out the first word in verse 15 there. Love is in fact the Greek word Agapeo, agapeo, which means the love of persons, to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly, to be well pleased with, to be content with, or content with a thing. It's the word from where we get the word agape, agape meaning, as you will no doubt know, brotherly love, affection, goodwill, love, benevolence, and so on. But agapeo is the word that's used in verse 15. As you must surely know, the word agape is the love of God, seen here in John's Gospel. John 
5 verse 42. John 5 verse 42. But I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. That's the love of God. This word agapeo is a, a, to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of. So what does all this mean? What then are we to learn from this short section of this first epistle of the Apostle John? The message really is, is clear and the message is simple. However, so apt are all of us to forget that we are in the world, but we are no longer part of it. What do I mean by this? Well, as human beings, we have needs. We want to be liked. We want to be happy. We want to be accepted. We want to be excited. We want to be welcomed by others. And we don't like to be feel left out or ignored. These are all natural feelings, which we were all controlled by when we were in and part of the world. Above all, we like to feel that we're in control and that we can handle any and all situations and circumstances that we come across. However, if you have been born again, your affections are, or should be, centred upon the one to whom you belong, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the Lord Jesus. Above all, as the Apostle tells us, it is vital that we understand and accept the fact that we are not in control, but God is. We are not the ones in control, but God is. If you are in Christ Jesus. This is why John addresses each level, if you like, of understanding within the body of Christ, for each of them has their own weaknesses. The little children or babes in Christ, the new believers in Christ only know and understand that their sins have been forgiven, so are yet unaware of the wiles of the devil and so on. The young men or those who have been saved for some time and who have overcome in some areas, but are apt to be, to be complacent, resting on past victories. The fathers or leaders within the body are well versed in the word of God and know their calling or their role in the body of Christ. The problem is that they are apt to think that they have nothing more to learn. Thus they become unteachable. John here, in his final three verses of our text, is exhorting all those who make up the body of Christ not to become complacent in their walk. Our walk. In other words, not to be seduced back into the ways and thinking of the world around us. We should continually, brethren, remind ourselves of the challenging words of Scripture, such as the following from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Underline that. This is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now these are two important words to consider in these verses. Those words are conformed and transformed. Conformed and transformed. The word conformed is the Greek word suskei matizo. Suskei matizo which means to conform oneself, one's mind and character to another's pattern, fashion oneself according to. Whereas the word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, metamorpho, meaning to change into another form, to transform, to transfigure. It also means Christ appearance was changed and resplendent with divine brightness on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's that kind of transformation. Now I hope that you'll see that there is a vast difference between the two words. This is exactly what the Apostle John is driving at in our text. John's listeners, including you and I today, are to prevent ourselves from being conformed to this world by either our own laziness or complacency. But we are to remember that we are to be rather transformed to the likeness of Christ. Not to conform to this world, but be transformed to the likeness of Christ. Yes, I know and I understand that we're in the world, but we are not of the world, saints. We are rather new creatures in Christ Jesus. So, brethren, brothers and sisters, let's read the last three verses of our text again as we close. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lusts thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Remember then, brethren, that everything in the world is now being used by the enemy of God to lure and seduce you and I, you and me, away from the straight and narrow way. Remember also that everything in this world will ultimately pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Hallelujah! This important message of the Apostle John is as vital for believers to hear today as it was for those in his own day. In fact, it's more important because we live closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ than they did. The reason being that these temptations will not go away. They will only become stronger and more frequent in your life and in my life and in the lives of every believer the closer we get to the return of our Lord. But it is to us to trust in the only one who can give us the strength we need to overcome them when they do come. Let me share an encouraging scripture with you as I close this first message of the day. It's a message that, it's a, a scripture rather that is very close to me. And it's Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. And I encourage you to write them down and put them on your refrigerator or on your desk at work or wherever you go. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I'm going to read it again as a close. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. May God rest richly bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name. Amen.